lunch, I think we should start because time is running and we have a lot to discuss today. Very exciting topic, ethics, AI and Africa. So a warm welcome from me to all of you. Nice to have you here. We are going to discuss about the future of artificial intelligence in Africa between ethical challenges and economic development. It's really a great and interesting topic. Sh some short words about me. I'm the moderator and I'm a freelance science and technology journalist. I write for most of the big newspapers and magazines in Germany like Die Zeit, Süddeutsche and many technology and science magazines as well. And AI and ethics is one of my biggest topics at the moment. And this is the topic here today as well. Developing countries should not be left behind by technologi technological change. But we need to raise awareness for the risks of AI, such as disinformation, a bias that AI has. I think this will be a big topic today. And AI-based human rights violations. AI and its, in its influence must be considered beyond German borders, and that's why we are here. But first, I would like to invite Norbert Bartle to the stage. He is Parliamentary State Secretary at the Federal Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development, and he will welcome you. Welcome. Mr. Bartle. So, thank you very much, Ms. Wolfanger, for this introduction. And uh, sorry, but I like to speak in my mother tongue in German, so we have to use your headsets if you have some. And if it's necessary, if you all understand German, it's a, it's a better way, but. <laughs> I feel it's not so, so uh, in spite of the fact that my ministry prepared a speech in German, I really prefer uh, to talk in German with you. Thank you very much. Sehr geehrte Frau Zambuli, sehr geehrter Herr Mschlanga, sehr geehrter Herr Luengo Oros, sehr geehrter Herr Breind, meine sehr verehrten Damen und Herren, liebe Gäste, ich darf mich zunächst einmal ganz herzlich dafür bedanken, ich freue mich sehr dass ich Gelegenheit habe, hier bei dieser wichtigen Konferenz zu entwicklungspolitischen Fragen, Stellungen und Perspektiven etwas zu sagen. Das ist ja nicht selbstverständlich und deshalb freut es mich sehr, dass ich die Gelegenheit habe. Ich sage Ihnen nichts Neues, wenn ich darauf hinweise, dass künstliche Intelligenz eigentlich der Driver, der Motor für die digitale Revolution ist. Und deshalb ist es ja auch richtig, dass das Motto dieses Kongresses lautet Künstliche Intelligenz, ein Schlüssel für Wachstum und Wohlstand. Nur wenn man dieses Motto liest und hört, dann fragt man sich natürlich zu Recht, was hat das eigentlich mit Entwicklungspolitik zu tun? Weshalb steht heute ein Staatssekretär aus dem Bundesministerium für wirtschaftliche Zusammenarbeit und Entwicklung vor Ihnen? Das ist ja schon etwas verwunderlich, denn Prima Vista, auf den ersten Blick sind wir ein Ministerium, das sich in erster Linie mit anderen Themen beschäftigt. Mein Minister sagt immer, Gerd Müller, von dem ich Sie gerne grüße, er sagt immer, wir sind das Ministerium für Hunger und Armut oder besser gegen Hunger und Armut. Aber das sind so die Leitthemen, die uns beschäftigen und selbstverständlich bleibt das auch in Zukunft unser Hauptanliegen, dass wir die Grundbedürfnisse, insbesondere wenn es um Afrika geht, die Grundbedürfnisse der Menschen dort versuchen äh, zu abzudecken. Das ist der Kern unserer Arbeit. Aber selbstverständlich geht es bei Entwicklungszusammenarbeit immer auch um technologische Entwicklungen. Das ist uns ein wichtiges Element, zumal wir ja insbesondere auch, und das ist mein Zuständigkeitsbereich, für wirtschaftliche Zusammenarbeit zuständig sind nicht nur für Afrika, sondern vor allem auch für die Schwellenländer. Und da sich die Schwerpunkte unserer Entwicklungszusammenarbeit ohnehin in den vergangenen Jahren deutlich verändert haben, ist es auch naheliegend, dass wir uns zunehmend mehr mit technischen Entwicklungen beschäftigen. Denn wir haben unsere Schwerpunkte dahingehend verändert, dass wir gerade mit Afrika, insbesondere mit Reformpartnerländern zusammenarbeiten, dass wir wesentlich mehr als in vergangenen Jahren auf Effizienz und Effektivität, also auf die nachhaltige Wirkung unserer Entwicklungszusammenarbeit Wert legen, dass wir mehr Transparenz erreichen wollen und dass wir vor allem auch den technologischen Wandel befördern wollen, weil wir davon ausgehen, 
dass Entwicklungs- und Schwellenländer eben nicht sukzessive unsere Entwicklungsschritte nachvollziehen sollen, sondern dass sie die Chance nutzen sollen, technologische Sprünge zu machen und sozusagen gleich in der Zukunft zu starten und nicht erst die lange, langen Schritte von der Vergangenheit bis zur Gegenwart nachzuholen. Das ist der Grund, weshalb wir, ins, weshalb wir insbesondere, wenn es um Entwicklungs- und Schwellenländer geht, vor allem auch dem technologischen Wandel gegenüber, besonders aufgeschlossen sind. Wir suchen bei diesen Themen den Dialog mit unseren Partnern und wir versuchen internationale Perspektiven und das Wissen, das vorhanden ist, im Dialog mit unseren Partnern einzubringen. Das soll dazu dienen, die globalen Ungleichgewichte zu verändern. Das soll dazu dienen, Chancen zu eröffnen und auch auf ethische Risiken künstlicher Intelligenz hinzuweisen. Also wir suchen innovative Lösungen für eine zeitgemäße, für eine nachhaltige Entwicklungszusammenarbeit. Und deshalb versprechen wir uns auch von dem Einsatz selbstlernender Maschinen entsprechende große Entwicklungspotenziale. Mit künstlicher Intelligenz kann man große Mengen an Daten analysieren. Das, denken wir, muss auch der Entwicklungszusammenarbeit zugutekommen. Und deshalb denken wir, können KI-Anwendungen beispielsweise auch perspektivisch dazu beitragen, dass man die Ausbreitung von Krankheiten, dass man das Entstehen von Dürren, dass man eventuelle Hungersnöte oder vielleicht sogar bewaffnete Konflikte vorhersagen, vielleicht sogar vorbeugen kann. Dazu kann man künstliche Intelligenz einsetzen. Und das ist nicht nur ein Versprechen, sondern wir wenden KI auch schon in einzelnen Feldern der Entwicklungszusammenarbeit an. Das ist also keine reine Zukunftsmusik mehr, sondern wir realisieren als BMZ bereits schon erste Projekte. Ein Beispiel Tunesien. Dort nutzen Bauern die von unserem Ministerium geforderte App, die nennt sich Plantix, um mit dieser App KI-gestützte Bilderkennungen zu nutzen, mit denen, mit deren Hilfe Pflanzenkrankheiten leichter festzustellen sind. Also die Landwirtschaft profitiert dort ganz enorm von diesem Projekt. Ich könnte ein weiteres Projekt anfügen in einem Schwellenland. Dort vernetzen wir hunderte von Supermärkten, um eine bessere Verteilung der dort regional frisch produzierten Lebensmittel zu erreichen und damit zu vermeiden, dass viele, viele Kilo wenn ich gar Tonnen von regional produzierten frischen Lebensmitteln verrotten, kaputt gehen, also Abfälle vermieden werden können durch Einsatz künstlicher Intelligenz. Und dennoch muss man feststellen, das zeigen auch diese Projekte, dass künstliche KI, dass Technologien für künstliche Intelligenz in den Entwicklungs- und Schwellenländern nach wie vor noch in den Kinderschuhen steckt. Da gibt es noch viele Aufgaben, für uns zu erledigen. Da gibt es noch viel zu tun. Das wollen wir versuchen voranzubringen mit unseren Partnerländern, um dort auch schneller den technologischen Wandel gestalten zu können. Wenn das dazu beiträgt, dass weder dort in den Entwicklungs- und Schwellenländern noch bei uns große wirtschaftliche Chancen verloren gehen, die in KI stecken, dann ist uns allen gedient. Jedenfalls denken wir, ist KI ein wichtiger Wettbewerbsfaktor, denn damit dominieren künftig vor allem die Industrieländer die Märkte. Wir beobachten heute schon, dass China und die Vereinigten Staaten hohe Milliardenbeträge in die Weiterentwicklung von KI investieren. In den Schwellen- und Entwicklungsländern, in unseren Partnerländern ist es dagegen wesentlich schwieriger, diese finanziellen Ressourcen zu mobilisieren, wer nicht genügend Mittel für die dringend notwendige Infrastruktur zum Beispiel aufwenden kann, der tut sich schwer, in KI zu investieren. Deshalb müssen wir Schritt für Schritt an diesen Dingen etwas ändern und unseren Partnern letztendlich eine gerechte Teilhabe am KI-Markt ermöglichen. Das ist unsere Zielsetzung. Deshalb versuchen wir vor Ort entsprechende Kapazitäten und entsprechendes Wissen aufzubauen, wir unterstützen die Entwicklung lokaler Lösungen, um die lokalen Bedürfnisse der Menschen vor Ort auch entsprechend abbilden zu können. Und wir versuchen 
die Ausbildungsmöglichkeiten vor Ort entsprechend zu verbessern, dorthin zu investieren, damit die Menschen dort morgen bei KI entsprechend kompetent auch mitreden können. Das ist nebenbei bemerkt eine weitere Schwerpunktsetzung unseres Ministeriums, was unsere EZ-Arbeit anbelangt. Ausbildung, Ausbildung und nochmals Ausbildung. Damit versuchen wir die Eintrittsbarrieren für Bürger, für Forscher, für Unternehmen zu senken. Und das gelingt uns nur, wenn wir das nicht im Alleingang tun müssen, sondern wenn wir viele Partner finden. Deshalb versuchen wir, weitere Partner mit an unsere Seite zu ziehen. Und da rede ich insbesondere von der privaten Wirtschaft. Und das ist nebenbei bemerkt nochmals ein weiterer neuer Schwerpunkt unserer BMZ-Arbeit, die zunehmende Einbeziehung privater Ressourcen, weil wir davon ausgehen, dass allein mit öffentlichen Mitteln die Aufgaben nicht zu stemmen sind. Wir brauchen das Engagement der privaten Wirtschaft, der privaten Investitionen, die das Ganze noch deutlich hebeln können. Auch das wollen wir nutzen. Lassen Sie mich aber nicht versäumt haben, noch auf einige Risiken hinzuweisen, die wir durchaus sehen, wenn es um besseren Zugang zum Markt mit KI geht. Einige wenige Unternehmen, insbesondere aus den Industrieländern, dominieren den weltweiten KI-Markt. Und da geht es natürlich darum, was geschieht mit den Datensätzen, die erhoben werden. Sind die konform mit lokalen Normen, Werten und Kulturen oder werden unsere Normen, Werte und Kulturen einfach weiter transportiert, landen sozusagen als Handlungsmaxime in den entsprechenden Algorithmen und erzeugen damit wiederum einen möglichen Diskriminierungstatbestand für benachteiligte Länder oder für benachteiligte Bevölkerungsgruppen, was dann durch KI sozusagen verfestigt würde. Das wollen wir vermeiden. Deswegen versuchen wir als BMZ, große Technologiekonzerne wie zum Beispiel Google oder wie Microsoft in die Pflicht zu nehmen, damit diese ihre Ressourcen auch verantwortungsvoll einsetzen. Und wenn das dazu führt, dass dann in den entsprechenden Entwicklungsländern KI-Denkfabriken entstehen, die den lokalen Kontext mit einbeziehen, dann ist das der richtige Weg. Und wie in jedem unserer sonstigen Kooperationsbereiche schauen wir immer danach, dass der Schutz und die Stärkung von Menschenrechten im Mittelpunkt stehen. Das gilt auch für alle Kooperationen von vor Ort. Deshalb freue ich mich, dass ich heute die Gelegenheit habe, hier unsere Kooperation mit United Nations Global Pulse, dem Innovationslabor der Vereinten Nationen, ankündigen zu dürfen. Wir wollen mit dieser Organisation, mit Global Pulse, verstärkt zusammenarbeiten mit unseren afrikanischen Partnern vor Ort und in dieser gemeinsamen Arbeit die notwendigen ethischen Rahmen, den politischen Rahmen für künstliche Intelligenz entwickeln. Denn daran fehlt es unserer Ansicht nach immer noch. Man braucht ein Rahmenwerk, ein Framework für KI und daran wollen wir arbeiten. Auch wenn wir heute auf einem deutschen Digitalgipfel sind, glaube ich, muss man dazu anregen, den Horizont zu erweitern, nicht nur auf Deutschland, nicht nur auf Europa zu gucken, sondern darüber hinaus unsere Partnerländer in Afrika mit einbeziehen. Und aus diesem Grunde werden wir auch schon in den nächsten Wochen gemeinsam mit Republika, die Digitalkonferenz Republika Accra in Ghana veranstalten. Das findet Mitte Dezember statt. Dort soll dann diese internationale Perspektive zu KI erweitert werden und die Arbeit, die hier und der Kenntnisse, die hier gewonnen werden, sollen dort weiter vertieft werden. Ich hoffe, dass von dieser Kooperation zwischen Deutschland und den Ländern in Afrika und allen weiteren Beteiligten alle gemeinsam profitieren können und daraus eine strategische Partnerschaft Digitales Afrika entstehen kann. Darin sehen wir Potenziale, um auch die Ziele der Agenda 2030 besser umsetzen zu können. Denn diese Agenda 2030 ist die Grundlage all unserer Arbeit im BMZ. Das ist unser grundlegendes Rahmenwerk. Und in dieses Rahmenwerk ordnen wir dann auch alles ein, was künstliche Intelligenz anbelangt. Abschließend darf ich noch ein Zitat nutzen von Stephen Hawking, der sagte kurz vor seinem Tod, Künstliche Intelligenz könnte entweder das Schlimmste 
oder das beste Ereignis der Geschichte unserer Zivilisation werden. So wird Stephen Hawking, wenn es uns gelingt, als BMZ mit Ihnen gemeinsam und mit unseren Partnerländern daran zu arbeiten, dass es zum besten Ereignis der Geschichte wird, dann ist uns allen gedient. Dazu sollen die Foren auf diesem Kongress einen Beitrag leisten und dazu wünsche ich Ihnen anregende und gute Debatten, unter anderem auch nachher hier auf dem Podium. Herzlichen Dank. Thanks a lot, Norbert Bartle. Yeah, I think we all, all of us hope that AI will bring the best for our future. We are starting with a short introduction talk of one of our experts, and after that we are going immediately to, the, to that panel here and discussing the things. Um, I want to welcome Musa Mulanga, who will give us a short presentation on the future of AI in Africa. And he's probably just the right person for that because he's working with AI and he's a researcher around genomics. He's a honorary professor at the University of Cape Town and is currently conducting research in the field of biophysics and gene expression. Welcome, Musa. Um, <coughs> thank you very much for uh, the kind introduction and thank you to the organizers of this digital summit for inviting me to, to give a, uh, a small talk. I have to find the pointer somewhere in my, uh, to change the slide, sorry, it's somewhere in my pocket here. I don't have the artificial intelligence to do it quickly. Um, so uh, when, when I was uh, asked to, invited to come here, I thought uh, I would talk about uh, gene editing and genomics because I think they are really convergent uh, events that are happening and they, they are bringing us to a point in terms of our ability to use artificial intelligence in human beings much, much closer to, to being a reality. And so um, I didn't plan for there to be some gene editing of Chinese twins a few days before, but um, it seems like it's a very uh, topical subject. So the context I think we should think about artificial intelligence and big data is in achievement of these sustainable development goals. And these are goals that have been put forth by the United Nations And I think particularly these goals here that are number two, three, and six, all the way to number 17 that are not grayed out are especially relevant to how artificial intelligence and, and big data and also genomics can make a very positive contribution to, to the future of Africa. But I really want to focus a lot on the effect of biology because biology is where the Silicon Revolution was in the 1970s. And Our ability to decode the basic elements, the basic recipe of life on Earth, is, is really the initial digitalization event that's occurring with biology. So biology is being systematically digitized, and our ability to digitize it is genomics, and that ability is accelerating extremely fast. And our ability to manipulate that data, that biological data, resides in things like gene editing and in synthetic biology. And the combination of these two necessitates the use of artificial intelligence because of the scale of the data to be able to decode this information usefully. So this is how these, these things converge. Now, where are we with gene editing? I guess we, we didn't think that we would be um, um, beyond this point of a Chinese group using CRISPR to edit a human embryo because we're already at beyond this point, which this was in 2015, and this is from The Economist, where some, this has actually been occurred and there's two live humans who've, who've actually undergone this gene editing. And I have a little bit more to say about what I think about that, but really our ability to digitize the genome and to create these large data sets is going to have effects throughout all of these regions, especially in economies of Africa. And I think Africa is going to feel this first in agriculture, especially in food, possibly in fuels and, and the ability to, to use biofuels, and to some extent in, in, in drug development. But the other areas are probably a little bit too expensive and inaccessible to the economies that exist in Africa. Now, 
of course, there are other ways that this use of um, decoding of genomics can be done. And we are seeing it increasingly by being able to manipulate nature, by trolling through data to uh, identify regions that are causing harmful effects at scale in the population, like through mosquitoes that are spreading dengue virus or spreading Zika virus, and being able to introduce genetically modified mosquitoes into the population so that they begin to dominate the population and exterminate those that are being able to transmit these diseases. And this is, this is sort of large scale altering our biological environment using the, the tools that we've acquired from gene editing and genomics and our ability to do very deep and extensive analysis at scale. Now, gene editing as we move forward is obviously gonna identify ways in which we can influence human biology. But I think the most recent examples that we've seen are sort of violating these seven principles, particularly in the areas of transparency and responsible science. And I think a lot of this has been written over the last few days about the recent events that have happened in China with editing twins. And you know, this is just the beginning of where we're gonna see this. And as our ability to mine data in the human genome becomes more accentuated through the uses of artificial intelligence and behavioral studies, we may start to see the ability to do this sort of gene editing, not for things like a gene that can protect us from HIV, but say genes that can alter fundamental aspects of human social activity or emotion or psychiatric behavior to be able to tune people at a level which is without precedent in human history. So, this ability in Africa to digitize biological data, especially in humans, is actually suffering from most things in Africa, which is lack of investment. The ability to do this sort of large-scale digitization relies essentially on next-generation sequencing. And on the continent of Africa, there are very few of these next-generation sequencers. So genomics as a data science, as an accessible science to artificial intelligence, because that's a key ingredient, simply isn't able to be performed at scale. And so this, all these applications of, of sorry, you just skip that slide, all these applications of, of the human genome really mean that Africa has been excluded in, in many ways. You can see here, most of the studies where the genome has been digitized, overwhelmingly, until 2009 were done in people from Europe. And since 2016, all of the new growth has essentially come from Asian populations that have been included. But essentially, our understanding of the genomics of humans is entirely from European ancestry. It, the contribution of people in Africa to this digitization effort is, is minimal. We're, we're at less than 5% of known genomes. That is sort of a protection mechanism as well because the ability to throw artificial intelligence at the African genome is also limited because of that. But um, for Europeans, that isn't the case. But what does the world miss out on by not having the inclusion of genomics from Africa? Well, I think one of the key things that the world misses out on is that the African population is the world's most genetically diverse population. And there have been models that have been done by evolutionary biologists which show that if all of us were to get killed in some horrible meteorite and a few people in Southern Africa were left alive, we could essentially repopulate the entire population of Earth with its same diversity. We couldn't do that if a person left in Norway, unfortunately, was left alive. So this means that actually it is really important for us to be able to acquire this data. So my laboratory works very hard in trying to do this, specifically for one of the most important emerging diseases in Africa. It's a non-infectious disease, a chronic disease, it's called cancer. And the only way really that we hear about artificial intelligence being used in health is in this space, because the sheer volume of information that needs to be analyzed. And so here we see how artificial intelligence through sequencing tumors and establishing gene drug associations can lead to deep learning and allow us to do data analysis and clinical data mining at scale. But 
there are some more disturbing things about this sort of digitization process, even if it happens in Africa or outside Africa. And that's because how is this data going to be used and who's going to own this data? Now, this has only been like a theoretical problem until very recently when we had this event happen. And this is a very famous company called DeepMind. You may remember DeepMind won several rounds of Go ag against human players. And it's a company that was started by Demis Haspis that was acquired by Google. And it has a special relationship with Genomics England, where it has access to the entire database of the NHLS, the NHS patients and their genomic data. And recently, DeepMind transferred all that data directly to Google. Now, I don't know if that could happen in Germany, but obviously we have this very serious problem that has led to this editorial piece in the Financial Times about Google's responsibility to protect this DeepMind data. And what is Deep Google doing with this DeepMind data? Well, it's throwing artificial intelligence at it. And you know, Google owns lots of quantum computing companies and doing all kinds of crazy things with that data. And here we have another one where we have one of the most valuable AI startups in the world. This one's also collecting a different type of biological data. And that biological data is facial recognition. The ability to recognize any face of any person in China. Because it has direct access to every single CCTV in China to acquire big data to train their algorithms by artificial intelligence. Um, only Facebook has more data of people's faces than this particular company. So this makes me kind of say at the end that we should really ensure that all people, regardless of their economic means, have access to the benefits of the technologies of the future and very much of the present. And we all have to understand that the necessary ingredient to develop this type of artificial intelligence is big data. And in places where we can convert analog to digital forms of data is where this is most important because this is giving that data access to artificial intelligence. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Musa. You can already stay here with oh, me if you want to, because we are now <laughs> starting with the pen, and you are already there. <laughs> yes, we had we've heard some interesting facts about the chances and the risks as well of AI, not only in Africa but in all of the world, I think. Um, and we would now like to discuss the benefits and these risks of this new technology for developing countries with our experts. And I would like to, to introduce them to you. So we have Nanjira Zambuli. She's senior policymaker at the World Wide Web Foundation. Welcome, Nanjira. <laughs> Her goal is to re reduce the digital divide in improving the access to technology and the use of it as well. Her most recent research includes work on information and communications technology and governance in East Africa. She researches as well about cybercrime and cyber resilience in East Africa and about the challenges of promoting access to the internet in developing countries. Our next expert is Miguel Luengo Orov. He is chief data scientist at United Nations Global Pulse. That's a project we already heard about. <laughs> Welcome, Miguel. He leads Global Pulse data science team, and he was, that really in, in impressed me a lot, he was the first, um, the first data scientist at United Nations in 2011, so he told me that changed until now, but they are more <laughs> today. <laughs> but he was the first, he's a pioneer. Um, and he has pioneered the use of big data for sustainable development, and interesting fact, he's the founder of Malariaspot.org, which is a platform that leverages video games, crowdsourcing, and AI for diagnosis of global health diseases. So that's a big chance for Africa and AI, I think. Our third expert is Reginald Eugene Bryant. Welcome, Reginald. He's a research scientist at IBM Research in Africa. He 
He has graduate degrees in electrical engineering and computer science from MIT, and he has invested four years of his research exploring possible causal and correlational effects underlying many of the grand challenges in sub-Sahara Africa. And last but not least, everybody is here, I'm confused, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to start again with the first one. Ah, I, yeah, and I'm already here as well. <laughs> um, I would like to start with a short round from everybody of you, and the question is what are the biggest ethical challenges around AI and Africa, or if you look a little bigger, developing countries. Um, maybe let's just start here with you. Okay, so the biggest challenges I, uh, for the most part, come from a data perspective, because in another life I was actually a semiconductor physicist. <laughs> um, so I'm very focused on the data and data uh, selection bias. So I think the, the biggest challenge was will the biggest challenge will be in the collection of data because there isn't a whole lot of data on the African continent, although we have some data and data silos and disparate and sparse data. The next step would be to actually collect data in a fair manner to actually select the things that are predictive to the things we want to know about, whether that's in healthcare sciences, whether that's in financial inclusion, uh, whether that's in agriculture. So the main thing, um, and actually the work that I'm focused on now is to make sure and to ensure that the data that's collected and the data that actually goes into AI systems or machine learning systems is fair to a certain degree. And beyond that, we want to look at the black box to investigate, to not only have explainable AI, but um, be able to interrogate and see what's going on from the machine learning perspective. So it all starts with data. That's where you have the most degrees of freedom to understand what is actually going on when machine learning algorithms are making their predictions on that data. So machine learning algorithms, AI, becoming commoditized. And the main, thing, the main thing we have to focus on is that we collect data in the right way and make sure the data that we collect from people remains secure. Thanks a lot. No, no. Thank you. Miguel, what's your so take on that? I mean, just to complement, uh, I think, I mean, one, obviously one of the risks or one of the challenges is that all these new applications are grounded on human rights, okay? Even if we go to uh, protection against discrimination, uh, discrimination even vis-a-vis -vis differences in DNA code, okay? Not just gender or, or race. So I think that's one. Uh, one other existing challenge maybe is that we have a very fragmented privacy landscape, okay? And, and we really need to push that forward so we make sure that all citizens have rights on, on their privacy. And maybe the last one is, is the fact that we have to create uh, applications uh, that are contextualized, okay? And in each country, in each place, uh, you have to find out the right problems and have uh, local uh, have locals people that understand the context creating the new solutions. It's not possible that we that people in Silicon Valley create solutions for the whole world. They are not adapted. I've trained Miguel well, so he says what I wanted to say. <laughs> <laughs> I think you have no, something it's more. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, um, the challenges that they've mentioned so far obviously are they are global in scope, but I think to the question of what specifically this means in the African context, really picking up from Miguel's point, is also outside of the technological realm. The reality and the, the, the positioning, the imagination that people have about Africa and Africans and where they fit in these processes. So if I go to data collection, who's, who's collecting the data? for instance, uh, who's storing the data, who is using it to make these decisions, uh, where is the agency and the informed consent of these Africans for whom these things are being done. Um, we look at the algorithmic black boxes. Where is it that they're being created now? What's very interesting with this topic um, that is artificial intelligence is that more than any other tech trend or hype that has come before it, very quickly people have realized they have to think about the ethics. But what we have to realize is that it's not an afterthought, uh, which has happened oftentimes. You know, the move fast, break things culture, the build it and they will come, the, you know, the poor people of the world need our help thing. Um, for the first time, 
um, people are starting to have this conversation on ethics even before we've had the large scale deployment of artificial intelligence. However, it is not an afterthought. It is not a short course you take at the end of <laughs> having done something. The question really is at what point and uh, in every step of the way, how are we uh, codifying the notion of ethics? It's um, um, who's being consulted in understanding the ethics of a particular context. We may have a very different understanding of the ethical thing if we were hacking around an AI application here to go deploy somewhere in Africa or elsewhere, or even here in Germany. But when we go to that place, what is their understanding of these ethics? What happens if it's different from ours? I think if we open up the thinking about ethics that way, we then realize we're going back to the fact that technology is not going to solve for the, pr the, human, the intrinsic human motivation. We're not going to outsource trust. We're not going to outsource these consensuses and tensions that exist between societies and people. We have to iron them out so that we make sure at any point we're collecting data, at any point we're appropriating data, um, that is factored in. The diversity of who we are as a people is factored in. Great, thanks a lot. Musa, you already told us some things. <laughs> I, I think it ju just works. Does it? Yeah. Just works. <laughs> Seems <Okay>. to. <laughs> um, I guess uh, from my perspective, uh, which is really very narrow, uh, the biggest challenges uh, are the ones that we confront in Southern Africa and I think in Africa in general around healthcare every day, which is really the absence of, of good data. And uh, I think that's been brought up by Miguel and, and to a certain extent by Reginald. And we, we, we really, I think, are understanding healthcare and s predictive solutions to intrinsically involve access to a large amount of data. I think um, in almost every use case that's presented to the public, to policymakers, to investors, somewhere in there somebody's talking about how healthcare is going to be the one that really is going to give us m really impactful outcomes so what i what i think is is really important and i think it, jari brought this up really well is that um the challenge we have is we would like to digitize a lot of what's happening in the clinical space in the biological space and acquire this data to be able to mine it with artificial intelligence in Africa in the same way as our colleagues are doing in, say, Europe in the United States. But we have challenges of infrastructure, we have challenges of cost, economic problems, and fundamentally, we also have a public health crisis because these are diseases that in less than a decade will really dominate the public health landscape, um, and here I'm talking about cancer and diabetes, and they could really benefit the most from this type of big data ingestion and the use of artificial intelligence. So when uh, you, you say, and I think it's, it's extremely important, um, don't just move fast and break things, but have a really good ethical framework of how you want to acquire this data and understand that different cultures may influence the ethics around what's acceptable in terms of acquiring and you know, digitizing such data, I think that pres presents a really unique challenge um, of deployment at scale, even if resources are available. So for me, I think this sort of summarizes the challenge uh, for me. It is often said that, especially in Africa or in developing countries, AI is a big chance, or even technology at all is a big chance, because there's missing infrastructure and there is a big step or a big hole which could be, be filled up with technology and AI and things like that. I, I saw this with drones, especially in Africa. People told me, of course, we don't have good roads. We, we, we drones are have much more impact than in Western countries. So how do you see this? Is it is it more a chance, AI now, to Africa, or is it more a danger, as you said as well? Um. Look, I, I, I have to say, like, from drones to cancer is a bit too big a leap for me to make. But um, I can see benefits of, of obviously, of, you know, self-driving drones that can deliver healthcare, uh, health solutions to diagnostic kits and medication to remote areas in, in places like Africa. I think, I think that would be spectacular. Again, there's lots of unintended consequences that could happen with that. And I think it's, it's also... In all of these solutions, we, we shouldn't ex sort of externalize the econo 
economic impact. I think the people who come up with the solutions for these problems are basically creating platform technologies that then become very quickly dominant in the entire landscape. And so as much as Africa is going to be a recipient of this, I think economically, if Africa is unable to create these sort of platform technologies, at least in the economics that exist today, then they're going to be perpetually excluded. And, and I think, you know, Europe feels a lot of that right now when they look over the Atlantic to the United States and they see, you know, three or four platform companies, you know, Google, Facebook, and Amazon. And they look around in Europe and they s feel like they're going to be left out of this future economy because as much as they have a lot of data, they haven't been able to marshal that resource. So you can imagine Africa looking at the rest of the world and thinking, well, we don't even have any of that. So, um, so for me, yeah, that's, that's the more serious part, which is that there's a huge economic consequence for all of this. And we're not even talking about that. We're just talking about ethics. Nadia, yeah, I saw you saying yes, yes, by the topic of unintended consequences. So what, for example, could it be? One big one that transcends, I mean, we might be gathered here next year and talking about a new technology, and maybe this will still come up. When we're talking about, um, you know, uh, as you were saying about the skill issue, there's a tension between skill and diversity. So what uh, the world and technologies have created this notion that we must scale. So some things, mobile technology has scaled, because it's in the hands of everybody, um, you know, the internet access has scaled. But when it comes to certain things like now healthcare and how you deliver it to a particular community, there's a, this assumption that you will test, uh, say, drones in Rwanda for delivering medication, which is happening. That was the use case I yeah, was talking about. Yeah, it's always the use case. Um, but it's, it's predicated on this notion that if it's worked there, it'll work everywhere else. I always like to tell people, whenever you're contending with the question of what you're trying to do for Africa, there's no buy one, get 53 free. <laughs> and even within one country is not necessarily that it will work because there are that diversity is I guess depending on how you're looking at it a gift and a curse we have to find a way to also be okay with supporting appropriate technologies that work for the communities that they will work with a true understanding that it may not necessarily work for the next one however that next challenge will be how then you get that interoperability to work but right now we're coming down with this top-down um, issue and I think if you uh, uh, like to ask people when you think about all the tech trends that have come whether it's internet of things whether it's X Y drones and all that the challenge of getting to any successes that we've said except pilot projects is because we have not figured out how to um, uh, balance the skill versus diversity thing and Africa and maybe even Asia are really good examples of how uh, to start thinking about that tension in a world that wants to you know put in reverse uh, sort of investments and resources and get the maximum return on investment at the shortest possible time. But at that layer, trying in a way, not factoring in the diversity of context and people, which obviously means it takes, uh, it means you take pause. Um, not, not everything will fit within a one year or three year plan. Um, then that means we start slowing down the pace of things, but that's not a very cool language when we're talking in tech. But then if you look at what we've been talking about in the last 10 years, everything you probably were investing in 10 years ago, you've moved on from it because you've not figured out that slow systematic way of actually addressing all these challenges from a lateral view. So uh, that's, that's a big issue. And, and even in how we think about policy investments and all these intersections, that lateral view, and especially when you're trying to work in Africa, is really where you'll get your return on investment. It's not going to be today, though, or tomorrow. It may work in one case, but there's no buy one, get 53 free. And but I guess that the sooner the better. And going down to AI, there is a, something particularly interesting, a good opportunity, is that uh, actually the technology itself is uh, almost all open source. Google, Facebook, name it, they are developing open source libraries. And, and the students at Makerere University are using those libraries. That's the reality. So actually, there's we have an opportunity. For sure, I mean, it's uh, maybe the limitant is something related to infrastructure. I mean, they might not have like all the computing resources, GPUs, but still, uh, technically, in any country, investing now in human capacities that learn to use these technologies, which are open source, and fostering more open source technologies is going to create an opportunity for the future. And I guess that here, I mean, another way to see this dichotomy is, is the risk of non-use against the risk of misuse, okay? And in some opportunities, we will have to, s I mean, we have to see how these, m how these methods 
uh, even if they are, they need to have some checks and balances regarding privacy and ethics, can be useful to solve problems. Okay, and here I'm thinking even regarding health, as, as Musa was saying. So we have on the one hand non-communicable diseases, which are influenced ma mainly by, by habits, and w there we need to really understand the context. We have also uh, communicable diseases like uh, malaria or, or Zika or Ebola, and there are uh, AI solutions that can be applied to help understand the spread of the disease. I mean, even tomorrow we are having, at, uh, I mean, with the World Health Organization is organizing uh, really a, a, a session on, on how to use AI for those diseases. But something that we are lacking maybe is to make sure that research roadmaps target, I mean, those those diseases, okay? Those diseases and these communicable diseases, but also like long-term non-communicable diseases. So maybe it's about creating also research roadmaps that look beyond, I'd say. If we talk about the big companies around AI, maybe IBM is one as well, we, we okay. could ask. What <laughs> <laughs> so what is interesting for IBM in Africa? Why did you expand your Watson team there? And what, what is your idea of how to how it could help you or IBM? What can IBM make out of it? Well, there was an interesting point made in terms, about in terms of people and context. And well, for the first time in our lab's history, since we've been here five years, we have all homegrown talent at the upper management levels. So our lab director is from Ethiopia. Um, our chief research scientist is from Ethiopia. And one of our lead um, organizers, Charity, she is from Kenya. So we have homegrown talent. And that took a while to get to that point. And this is the one thing ab about actually setting up shops here, in, in, and I applaud Google for doing that in Accra, um, that once you go into these lands, these countries of emerging economies, then you will be able to see that the problems are real and the problems can be addressed by including everyone to grow that homegrown talent to solve these issues. And so that's what we've done and I'm, I'm very confident in the lab's direction now in terms of the problems we're going to address as well as the techniques we're going to use to address them. Um, and, and, it, and, it, and it just came as a matter of dollars and cents. There's a blooming population in Africa which is attractive to big multinational corporations as well as emerging um, middle class where you have 10 major cities accounting for 100 million middle class people, and that goes beyond just the dollars, but more of education, as well as economic, economic um, capabilities that these people have. Um, so you're looking at roughly around $400 million per day of capital disposable income that can be leveraged for them to be a corporations, but once they come in there and they realize that it's not just a corporate responsibility act of just giving money away, that in fact there are sustainable ways to make technology work for in the African context. So that's the main thing that we're trying to get to. So just as we targeted Kenya because of the, the particular starting situation around 2007 and 2009, I guess you can correct me if I get some facts wrong, um, delaying a fiber optic cable for cables to connect Kenya to the rest of the, w to the, rest of the n internet. So you have low cost internet access, smartphones, which everyone, there's a, a good population that owns cell phones as well as a good population that owns smartphones. And then the um, response of Ushahidi and in turn iHub as a response was all ground roots um, motivated. So there were technologies in place with the smartphone and fiber optic cables that allow this kind of emerging um, atmosphere of economic mobility for a lot of the youth. And we want to continue that growth at IBM, as, as IBM with the use of AI technologies as well as blockchain. So we want to replicate that sort of that event where we're actually growing technology from the ground roots instead of a top-down remote transplant of technology. So that's the, that's the beautif beautiful thing that we've done and we applaud Google for making that investment in Africa as well. And we imagine that other corporations will do the same and once they realize there is economic viability and that there is a chance to actually improve everyone's well-being from the ground up, then you will see more of this come to fruition. If you look at the local companies, small and little 
um, companies, how important is AI already for them and for their business development? Uh, how important is it? Um, <laughs> It's 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 very important, but the, the the major thing like I want to emphasize is the, the the data at the data end because right now there isn't a whole lot of visibility in the supply and demand side of these small to medium enterprises, and actually small to medium enterprises for a good number of emerging economies in major cities account for not only a good contribution of GDP but also employment. So once we crack that problem and actually getting the data and doing it in the right way where everyone's data is protected and they have access and they have it as their um, bargaining chip and we develop platforms to respect that, we can then use this AI technology, this machine learning methodology to um, actually make fair assessments and make it easier for financiers to invest in these um, growing market of SMEs and and the different people that are finding utility out of being players among that market. So it starts with data, and that's my opinion. <laughs> I think that's what all of you said until now, that data is a problem. You said open source, Miguel, it's, it's, it's already there, and it's good because the big companies already offer open source solutions. But the bigger problems are the data and this bias AI produces out of data which, which are not good or not suitable to the problem. Um, Musa, is that a problem in your daily life as a researcher, and do we have a solution for that? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a really big problem. Um, I guess the, the most typical use case is um, today, I think, if, if, if a person in, in Europe or the United States has cancer, there is, there is a large cancer genome atlas that's maintained by the NIH that includes tens of thousands of cancer samples that have been collected from different studies that have occurred in Europe and the United States. And those genetic backgrounds um, have very specific predictable outcomes that we can really mine from this cancer genome atlas and predict. And so that's led to this era of, uh, this nascent era of precision medicine, where in precision oncology, you're able to get your tumor sequenced, they know which variants in the DNA are driving the tumor, and, they, and these in general can be, not all the time, but can be matched to, to drugs that are effective. Um, it took a lot of money and a lot of time to make the Cancer Genome Atlas. And um, just to underline how important this is, um, in China, which has a different ancestry from Europe and the United States, they've spent a huge amount of money to make a Chinese atlas. And um, in Japan, they've already done that. And the thing that we don't have is a cancer genome atlas for Africa. So that means that there's kind of a structural data barrier. Um, and the only available data is sort of data that's made available to in the cancer genome atlas in the US and to a certain extent what's being curated in, in Asia. So, so that means that for precision oncology, um, this is, this is a barrier to being able to really correctly forecast which drugs will be matched directly to these specific variants that we find in tumors in Africa. And, and we've worked a lot with IBM Watson to, to try to use some of their tools to do this. But you know, that, that still doesn't solve the ingestion problem, which is that you need to be able to collect large amounts of tumors from patients in Africa to be able to digitize this data. I actually yes. have a question for Musa. Yes, How much of that do you think is uh, linked to sort of just the challenges that have existed with health sectors predating um, all the mechanisms we have to collect such, such data? Because I would even contend it's not that there isn't data, it's just that it's just not been collected in any coherent way to actually say that, you know, I mean, a doctor writes on a notepad when somebody comes in for, you know, testing, but how that is processed into a system, I think, could be argued is the data challenge. But yeah, how it links to the traditional healthcare challenges we have. Yeah, so, so really, I mean, I think, I think you could say that, say, about infectious disease, but I think, I think in terms of non-chronic diseases, especially like cancer, it's, it's digitizing a doctor's handwritten notes are not gonna match a drug to, to a therapy. So what is going to match a, more likely match a drug to a specific individual is gonna be our ability to take that cancer and to break up those cells 
to take the DNA and put it into a next generation sequencer and convert it from biology to digital bits. And, um, and that, that hardware and that process is expensive. And so very little of it exists in Africa. In fact, the, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation currently has a grand challenge that's trying to focus this type of sequencing just on infectious diseases. But just to a point that Miguel made earlier, I think infectious diseases in Africa have been a severe impediment because they've overburdened the healthcare system. However, um, and this, not to scare anyone, but infectious diseases aren't the problem anymore. Because if you look at a country like South Africa, which funds its infectious disease treatment entirely domestically, okay? So it has the largest number of HIV patients in the world, has the highest, biggest treatment program for free in the world, so over three million people for TB and HIV, it spends 80% of its health budget just on those infectious diseases. And so what's gonna happen in an economy like that when seven years from now, that whole landscape is completely dominated by non-infectious diseases? So the data ingestion that has to occur or should have occurred in this area for the last decade hasn't occurred because the health system's been dealing with another problem, and this is the richest country in Africa. And so the infrastructure, the hardware to be able to do this doesn't really exist. So I think, I think these problems are, are, you know, every person's problem is somebody's opportunity. And I think one country that's really seen that opportunity is China and has come to kind of give people in South Africa large scale resources to do sequencing so that they could collect this data and eventually <laughs> you know, provide solutions. But you know, this is the difference, I think Miguel brought this up beautifully. He said, what's the risk of non-use versus misuse, right? So anyway, I'll leave it at that. Well, I think that's clear, non-use is better than misuse, but how can we get nearer to that point that we can use it for good? Okay, I think, I think yeah, it looks like you have an answer for that. That's <laughs> <great>. <laughs> I mean, I'm going to just take a step back, okay? Because I guess that this one example is the health sector, but actually, I mean, looking what's going on in the world. So around 20 countries have presented their AI strategies, okay? Being Germany, one of them. And uh, I mean, the other countries, I, was, I mean, and we are having a risk of creating a new AI divide, okay? Because as we said before, the tools are there, you need the capacities, the longer you wait, the more you will pay or you will not catch up, okay? So I, I guess that this is one of the things that we indeed expect to support with, uh, together with, uh, with the German government from UN Global Pulse is creating the, the frameworks or the blueprints that allow countries to develop their own AI strategies, okay? And these strategies have th things around data ingestion, but also around privacy, around ethics. I mean, this will touch jobs, obviously, like employment and jobs will change everywhere, uh, capacity research. So I guess that one of the first things we have to do, I mean, worldwide, I mean, no matter where you're with, with your country, is, is really to think, and governments need to think from the leadership, which is gonna be our position regard vis-a-vis -vis these AI strategies, okay, to, uh, to avoid this AI divide. And I think that even when you check those countries that have already presented their strategies, you can see how the context is embedded in these strategies, you can see, how the Chinese strategy looks like. Okay, obviously, I mean, looking with it's a, it's a system perspective, you see how France presented AI for humanity. You see how a North American uh, US strategy is more focused on the private sector. So I guess that we have also the opportunity to embed the, the, human, the human context in these strategies, and that's something that we have to do, I mean, as soon as possible. It's maybe the first brick for, for AI for good. Can you maybe just give an example or ex explain a little bit more concrete this pro project you have together with BMZ? Yep, so we are, I mean, we, we are starting, what we hope to do over the next year is, is work on uh, AI policy uh, and AI innovations. On the policy side is, is uh, helping uh, some countries in, in Africa, I mean, starting by uh, Uganda, where we have an innovation lab, where we have been working there for the past five, five years. We have a, a big a local data science team, actually, uh, and, and we work closely with the government. We have been helping them um, working on, on privacy, and we expect that from there, we can work on ethical frameworks of, of use, supporting that part. Uh, so 
if we are able to align private sector, public sector, academia, and civil society, work together towards something that could be like a blueprint for, for AI strategies in Africa and hopefully beyond. Okay, we, are, we, we expect also to have connection with, with our lab and our team in Indonesia. On the other hand, I think it's not just talk the talk, we need to walk the walk. So we, wanna, we will be working and supporting uh, local teams on developing uh, AI innovations. Okay, and one example, something that we have been working over the past year is uh, natural language processing. Essentially, I mean, when you speak to your phone in German and in Spanish, uh, it got uh, trans <coughs> transcript into text. But th that technology doesn't exist for, for many local African languages. So we have been working with Stellenbosch University in South Africa, developing um, speech-to-text technologies for local Ugandan languages and, and Somali. So that's one example of AI applied, okay? And this is being used for, uh, for several projects regarding like uh, health uh, epidemics or like low-scale natural disasters or even like mining public radio talk shows that talk about corruption. I mean, what, what people are, are saying, because probably the most used social network, at least in Uganda, is, is, is radio, and, and people call to the talk shows, okay? This is another way to, to understand what, what people is concerned about. This is something I really often hear about, that face recognition doesn't work with black women, or bla works best with, with middle-aged white men or what you said, um, NLP doesn't work with several local languages in Africa, or works best with English, of course. So is that, is that a problem for industry maybe as well? Um, or is it, as you said, Musa, maybe the chance for the people not to be recognized by facial recognition, things like that? Or <laughs> <laughs> so is that, I would like to discuss this a little bit in the last five minutes we still have. Is that, which part of it is good, which is bad, and how can we change the things that are bad? So, Miga, you want to answer? Yeah, I mean, I say that one thing is that sometimes there is no initial commercial incentives f to create those technologies. So maybe because it's too small. The because it's too small, small. But maybe it's just jump starting. So maybe the, the ball will will become bigger. Then, I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna let you speak about the the potential problems because I guess that, for instance, in this case of uh, speech text technologies, there is a, there is also a, a chance for misuse. Okay, and that's obvious. Yeah, but I'm not just an agent of doom. There is really good value in uh, <laughs> artificial <laughs> intelligence and, um, and, and voice, actually. We did a study at the Web Foundation last year looking at the state of AI innovation uh, on one hand and AI policy in Kenya, Nigeria, and South Africa as a start. And one, one big potential was actually on, uh, even for democracy, is in, in having people engage more through digital platforms using the mediums that they know best, voice being one of them. But like again, I said, why maybe it's not had commercial interest is if you find a region that maybe four or five million people even speak one language, but the work you put in to do that, right? And there's, you know, Kenya or Uganda have at least 40 or so different, lang you know, per country, different languages. There's that sort of like challenge of skill. But back to your point about capacity and infrastructure, these things are all interlinked and much as we take um, tunnel visions in a topic like AI, it's so intersected to how education policies or in, uh, you know investment goes and I was taken by the fact that you're working on uh, what I assume is Luganda and and and, and uh, uh, you know Luganda and mission, but you're doing it in Stellenbosch as opposed to Makerere which means there's something about the infrastructure on how education has been invested well how many <laughs> Ugandans will get visas to go to South Africa <laughs> to actually you know contribute to that so there's a whole other um, angle that is often overlooked in these discussions. That's why people like me always end up seeing in like the Debbie Down. I'm like, if you go to how an education summit right now, are they even thinking about how they would train for people to be, um, you know, creators and users in a digital age? This is a huge challenge. But while you'll do great work by creating cultures, inundating cultures, but it's part of a bigger challenge, but there are great opportunities. At the same time, obviously, there are risks, but I wanted to show that this also... Yeah. No no good actually, it's with Macari and Stellenbosch, but... You <laughs> didn't say Macari. Yeah. <laughs> so would it be one of the first steps to do, to go to that goal, making sure that we use... You want to say something else? Okay, start no, with I it. I just want to say something really briefly, which is I think it's I there is a natural language processing program in South Africa and in, in, in I think at least three universities, mm -hmm. um, th which is really impressive to, to make like Google work in, in the, the eight official languages of South Africa. I, I, I do think though that um, there, there is a very deep collision between um, developing 
artificial intelligent policies in these countries and the economic, overwhelming economic benefit from developing sort of very neoliberal economic artificial intelligence policies. And that collision, I think, bumps up against what I described earlier between the Euro Europe and the United States. So as much as I think these frameworks are extremely important, I just want to understand how do you accommodate that in your UN global pulse, you know, policy framework? Yeah. I mean, I guess that uh, I'd say that there are like two sides. One is, I mean, when you start, as I said at the beginning, I think human rights is like the like the basis, okay? And we have to make sure that those ideas are incorporated in the in those principles. And for instance, I mean, the privacy principles, uh, that data privacy principles that uh, we we develop and we're going to be adopted by the UN system in the in the coming uh, weeks. Uh, they, they have the human rights as the basis. Then, obviously, there is this question, I mean, where each country would like to go, okay? And I guess that in this case, uh, we, as the UN, will just put on the table the different possibilities. We will bring, I mean, European countries, we will bring other other ideas to the table and would be the countries that will have to decide how they want to run their strategies, always, always like based on, on this initial setup. Since I see that the time is already over and we are running <laughs> into a g getting over time, um, thank you so much. I think that was a good point in the end that we sometimes maybe look to Eurocentristic or think it's it's easier as as it is if you look to the real to, to the real uh, how is it f in 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 the, in the real world. Um, so thank you so much for being us with us here. It was great to talk to you. I think we all now understand a little bit better about the opportunities and the risks of AI in Africa. I have to make at least one announcement, which is very important and great, um, because we think, of course, we need to discuss that in Africa as well. And there is um, a great event, Ber Berlin's so-called Internet Conference Republica is going to Accra. And it will take place next week on the 14th and 15th of December. And I think some of you or maybe all of you will be there as well. And maybe some of you. So go there, discuss with us. See you there. Thanks a lot for coming. It was great.